So I'll talk about um, the impact of Docker containers slash OCI containers on Linux. Um, it's a topic I could talk very long about, so you know I'll, I'll try not to torture you too much. I include a lot of oversimplification. Some of you probably will uh, disagree with me on that. Feel free to do so. Um, this is not necessarily, well, so I work for Red Hat and you know, put in a little demo. I've done that for some time. I used to run the product management for RHEL now in engineering, kind of architecture, uh, and Android integration. So if, if you use uh, um, RHEL 5, RHEL 6, I'm sorry, my fault. Um, <coughs> I, I, I did that. Um, I, I've been, basically all my professional life, I've been in open source business and uh, at Linux specifically. Um, and so I'm, I'm giving a perspective on the transformation we're in and the change of paradigm we're in, very much from a Linux-centric point of view. Right? This thing, some of the things that came before, but that's part of the game. Right? So um, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a Red Hat <coughs> official position because you know, some of you who know Red Hat realize that Red Hat in itself is actually an open source community, so you will never ever get a full official Red Hat position. However, and I'm, I'm happy to share the slides. Uh, um, uh, however, like this is one of the, this is this is one of the that influences the Red Hat position a lot. In my current work, <coughs> what I do is uh, I drive the container architecture at Red Hat. You know, with other people, it's always multiple people. So. The title, the original title of the deck, it, it was in a, a gray beard with my name. That was kind of a, a, a spin of the like, people forking dead in our system being, right? And the thing was like, okay, if you haven't forked uh, the Linux distribution over system B, I'll get you to fork it over this. So we'll see. Um, so the, the, the I need, I need my notes. I have a, a split screen, so I don't see it here. I see it here. That's beautiful. So, so um, the the fundamental problem. This is, you know, it's the discussion is very important. Red Hat kind of fitting into the hybrid cloud where things are going. Um, what is the role of the operating system, which for Red Hat is really important. Most of you probably know Red Hat primarily from the operating system, from the Linux distribution. Right? But Red Hat has a whole bunch of products. You know, from storage of uh, OpenStack, RHEL, to PaaS, to middleware, since we bought JBoss about like 11-ish years ago. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's they always like a discussion, like what's what in there? Like how does this stack fit together? And at the end, you know, that discussion was led to this, 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 this presentation and, and the positions I'm, I'm presenting here. Um, so in, in an abstract, Representative of the stack. Traditionally, the operating system in Linux will be seen as part of the infrastructure. But if you if you go to an application-centric view, there is another surface, not the hardware surface of the operating system that is seen as the most important one, but rather the application surface. You know? If I ask a customer why do you care about Linux, they're not going to say, oh, because it enables hardware anymore. You know, at the point they did. But they're probably going to care about it because it makes applications run. That's what people are actually exposed to when they interact with the operators. So, the, you know, history, and, and to take a historic perspective, which is, you know, I'm trying not to be too Red Hat centric, but of course it is. But, you know, historically, if you look at mainframe stacks, we, we look at a vertically integrated stack. You know, in most cases, the, the vendor retained control over the whole stack. And um, as a user, you would lease or rent the hardware and the software and the rights to the software. You know? If you needed more capacity, IBM would just you know, log in and give you more capacity on the machine. And it was actually an operating system controlling the environment uh, in virtualization. And you know, your ownership was very limited. Your choice was very limited. You were in a vertically integrated um, environment. And if you know, Unix came around, they called it open systems. And yes, I'm skipping a bunch of things, and you know, there are other ways to, to slice this. But you know, the experience we had kind of 
mid-90s was you had Unix, so-called open systems, where you still had vertically integrated half an operating system and two chain. Uh, you had a semi-open um, ISV ecosystem. You could choose some alternative software, but at the end, you still depend on the certification from the hardware vendor and you know their two chain. You couldn't just offer software for IBM Unix systems without IBM's blessing. Okay. It wasn't possible. Um, and Linux or GNU Linux, for uh, this more, more correct. <laughs> He's not here. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, I agree actually with him. I am, I'm a different discussion. Um, the, you know, Linux became important because what Linux gave you, aside from you know, letting you use a commodity PC hardware to do the same things you were doing with your Unix workstation. Um, or your Unix servers, it gave you free choice. As soon as that hardware was good enough for, for professional enterprise use, it gave you the free choice of a hybrid infrastructure. You buy your hardware however you want, and then completely open ISV ecosystem. Right? Open to the degree that the whole operating system was open source, free software, you can do whatever you want. Right? And then we, we develop an environment around that. And if you, if you map that to the modern world of hybrid virtualization, then you know, Linux still has this role of opening up an open ecosystem across different infrastructure options. And I'll go deeper into that later, but if you look at what the public cloud is, the public cloud is actually a re- invention of the vertically integrated mainframe stack. It's moving faster, it's you know, of course temporarily open, you can run whatever you want on, on Amazon. But at the end what Amazon wants you to do is to use their services and they're vertically integrating. They want you, if you write software, to use their APIs without even knowing what's behind it. It doesn't matter, is what they tell you. And um, you you basically get into this vertically integrated solution. Every cloud vendor wants it. And every proprietary private cloud wants it. So the, the, the thesis I'm, I'm putting away is that the role of Linux actually is again the same role that it had when we broke the vertically integrated Unix stack and introduced choice into that. It's the same role in the public cloud or across a different virtualization. You know, and, and, and I'm going to take a step back now and go actually to talk about containers. But this important, this framework is really important to understand um, the role that that I think containers play. So um, going back early Linux, and actually not only Linux, but you know early Linux software stack management. You know, in the beginning was user local and sto, and we compiled everything on every machine. Um, servers were special pets, right? They were, uh, you know, they were not just pets. They were dog show exhibit, right? You you had multiple admins per machine. You you know, mounted you know, you mounted binaries over NFS because you know this space was so precious. Um, and you know it was basically the, the same model you had for like big Unix server. And I remember at my my university um, we had like you, you, there were three. Three groups of systems. There was a there was a, a, a VAX um, somewhere that uh, also ran the access control. It's kind of interesting that we got accounts of that. But you know, anyhow, um, there were a bunch of Sun servers, and then there was this pool of PCs with Linux. That, like you know, kind of the rejects used, but that actually was the fun part. Um, and uh, they had like I think they had five admins for the Sun server, right? And um, and then you could mount things and stuff like that. And the, the problem with that model is that at the end, because you compile and use a local, you know, the, the actual behavior of each binary depends really on the state of the machine at the time where you compile it. Right? Which is fine if you have one big server with five segments, but as soon as you're in the Linux space with PCs, and many of them, and it scale out, um, that just doesn't scale. Right? 
So the next thing we got to was scalability through binary packaging. That's why RPM, Debian packages, bunch of others were, were introduced, right? Earlier, it started out with you compiling user local. Um, you um, uh, really, I'll send you the slides. <laughs> um, you start in compiling user local, then you know, we had binary tar distribution, like Slackware had that, and then uh, Red Hat introduced RPM, Debian introduced uh, Debian. Uh, Pector, I'm sure there were others. Um, it's the ones I used. Um, I don't remember which one was first. The whole point was that you can compile in one place, manage the configuration of your binaries, then run them across you know, a large number of machines without with predictable results. I can install them, it manages dependencies, it's always the same behavior because the state of the dependency tree and the software and the compiler option, there are no dependencies on the individual deployment. Um, and it also, in, in, you can actually remove things. That was a nice change from before, you know, other than like putting timestamps somewhere and then running find jobs to find everything that was newer than that timestamp and needed, things like that. Um, so, you know, it was very good. There was a side effect though. It implicitly moved us to a to a single instance, single version stack. Right? And the, while we are compiling in user local, it was common that you would have like multiple versions of the same stack. You know, um, especially up in the like in in the branches of the dependency tree. Right? You probably had one glibc usually in the system, but then you know there were different ways of so multiple different stacks in parallel. RPM. And, you know, actually, Deb and, and RPM both ended that, right? RPM is totally optimized to have a single version of every component of the stack on the machine. It does, you know, it has theoretical support for some relocation. It doesn't work. No one does that. It's crazy, right? <laughs> and um, it, it, you know, if you want different versions, and, you know, that, that for rather that became a problem with, like, Python 3, really. Before that, it was not so much, but then you started, like, branching out whole um, whole uh, parallel deployment of whole like stacks on their own the only way you can do that is by renaming the package right? that's how you do it you just create a set package and now you get into maintenance issues and we have we have something we call software collections in rel to be able to have newer versions of things ship in the core distribution that move faster, right? So you can have a, a long life cycle version and there's the whole enterprise life cycle and then you have a faster version that's called the software collection. That's basically a relocated, renamed version that is installed into slash opt. And then, you know, it's kind of an alternative kind of mechanism to anything like that. You know? So it's basically RPM namespace tricks to be able to have multiple versions at the same time. Um, one issue with this, and, and, and then you can look at this as a late binding model, right? We, we bind the stack when we install the software on the machine, right? That's when you instantiate the specific dependencies. One issue with that is that um, every, comp you know, the, the, every component is independent, gets built independent, gets updated independent, and you move basically, the, the, the best practice how you move that through your, your build, uh, dev build, uh, test, uh, um, production stack is with recipes. You use, depending on what you do, you, you, know, you use Puppet or things like that, in like the DevOps version one approach. And you create, um, so you, you, you build something with a specific definition of your manifest. You know, in RPM, nicely manages your dependencies. You add stuff on top of that. Probably have some, some um, Puppet definition or something comparable um, that defines the stack. Then you run it into a test and someone goes in and reconstructs this stack from the components. You basically build this up again. You always build it up from, from scratch. And the problem with that is that in the meantime, you know, SSH was updated or OpenSSL was updated or something else was updated. You know, I, think, I don't know what, what the current statistic would be. We ship like an insane amount of errata across the, what is it, 3,000 packages we have in RHEL, right? And it's just RHEL, right? That's actually a very small enterprise distribution. Fedora, like I'm constantly updating my freaking laptop. And um, you know, so, so what you test is actually not exactly what you build with. Because it's slightly changed. And then you run it in production and you update it again. And uh, it's so what you run in production is slightly different from what you test. 
And then we are expecting that you can update in production. Uh, you can update in production for security issues at any given time without affecting the application. Right? And you apply a security update there. In the modern world, it's a complexity that's really hard because there's so much change in the stack all the time. Because software is more and more uh, complexity. You know, the stack has grown. I think we basically, with every major release of RHEL, we doubled the size of the enterprise distribution. Right? So, um, yeah, it's pretty much doubled it every time. So we doubled, and, and, and you know, we had, at the minimum, we doubled the, the errata in my throughout that. Um, and so there's constant change. So you never, you never run the same thing in production that you developed on or that you tested. And even like in a large cluster, when you're done applying one patch through all your machines, you're starting over with the next patch. Right? And all you know in a in a large cluster, you will never have all your machines in the same freaking state. Right? The next thing we add is optional dependencies because you know static dependency trees, which you know RPM had, Debian is more advanced. They already have optional dependencies. Optional dependencies means that you know you don't have to install cups on every server. Basically, that's what it comes down to. Right? Because right now it's impossible to get rid of cups. And most servers don't really want to ever print anything, so it's not really helpful. To so you want to get rid of cups. You make it an optional dependencies where you know you start breaking up the the you know, so 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 the paradigm. Oh, we create this binary redistributed thing with always the same behavior. We break that up because it becomes impractical because you install too much crap and that's a security issue and too much you know or too much hassle. Or if, if you know you install cups cups has a security issue, now you're updating your machine because of something you're never using, right? It doesn't make any sense. So you're breaking it up. But at the point where you have optional dependencies, soft dependencies, you're back to the state of the software you install depends on the state of the machine at the time, right? You, you go back basically to compiling things in user local. It's, you know, we don't compile things anymore, but we kind of link them in production. And I probably should have gone to more slides um, uh, because I probably have slides on this later, but whatever. Um, so, you know, so there is a problem here, right? We, so we are basically back in the level of complexity that we had with compiling things in user local. In practical, for practical reasons, when you run a large cluster of Linux machines, whether it's virtual or physical, doesn't matter. Um, you can't keep up with the patching. And the state, the behavior of the system un has become unpredictable to the same degree, or actually more probably than it was unpredictable when we were compiling a user local and you know some f missing you know automake dependency kind of made some feature go away. Right now, it's some someone you know some transaction in yum failed or something was wrong in Puppet at a certain you know, a certain time, and suddenly the behavior of the system is different than what you expect it to be. So. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going back. So, so you know, I already talked about it. We had CF engine, Kickstart, stuff like that. We had several management puppets. So that's what, how we tried to take care of that. Um, and and you know, so the traditional model is you know, you have single user space for for all applications, right? That's part of this model that we manage this way. Um, and the the and then the operating system defines your application um, lifecycle. The operating system has a shared environment, and you're standardizing against the shared environment. That's the promise of the enterprise distribution, right? We, as Red Hat, give you enterprise Linux. That means you have a defined lifecycle for a software stack that you can rely on, you can keep using. We backport our fixes to it. We backport new hardware enablement. And we do new major releases when hardware enablement backports into the kernel have become too hard, or the general pressure of features in the user space has become too much. Right? Too many people demand a new GCC, new glibc, and new kernel. And when you do new major releases, that's the only driver. Interestingly, you know that's still primarily the hardware driver even today, because you know where it gets too hard is when there is you know a new a new network subsystem, too many changes. Um, uh, right now, I think the the next big thing is doing persistent memory that just gets too hard to backport and maintain ABI, and so you need to change that. It's actually usually not the user space. Like glibc doesn't 
what, what you have is new ver new things in the like the kernel to glibc and gcc stack that also you need you need to update glibc and gcc in order to actually use the new kernel software or hardware enabling features that's why you update the operating system and um, you know, then you you try to standardize all the applications and you usually have it uh, setting standards saying this is the image you have to use you know every application developer has to use the same stack gold image um, and everyone is happy in reality um, that that is not very flexible and, and you know the, the dependencies get hard to manage right it's too many dependencies that's why we need now optional dependencies um, and uh, uh, it just the 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 hardware moves too slow for most user space right so the next model we had for that was virtualization and public cloud and all that where you use a VM to break that up right um, you you run a hype, have a hypervisor to run the hardware you have a full operating system in a virtual machine you standardize around two different things and you give the application owner choice out of a, a selection of VM content they can use um, the, it, it works fairly well because you know you, people can move at their own speed you can mix different operating systems different versions of operating systems it's all good the problem is it's a lot of overhead right you're now managing two complete different layers and the VM is a black box um, where you know it really gets hard to cross the boundaries you want to do backups you need a, a you know, pretty advanced support of the whole system to make sure that you can back up certain things your management agents operate on two levels um, you want to do a handover to and you know and there's this parallel theme that everything is software now so there's more and more software being written by line of business so you want to give them the freedom they want the freedom to run in their VM whatever they want to run the problem is now two people have to have root accounts in this virtual machine the IT people to manage you know the, the, the agents and the application owner to install their software in reality what happens is most customers we see is that they kind of they they're not supposed to have root the application owner doesn't have to suppose isn't supposed to have root right the, the, the IT group is supposed to have root but in reality they get root for a short amount of time and we trust they're going to do only the right things and only install approved software and then their own code and then they take root away and of course no one knows what's in there anymore, right? so any ask any kind of what do you know what's in your VMs and like if you're honest they say no not really um, and uh, you know, at the end, you still have a lot of the security issues because you know, the VM is just virtual hardware, right? It's just multiplexing hardware into virtual environments. So you can, you know, be a bit more flexible. You don't have to be tied to the hardware lifecycle. That's all it does at the end. Um, it is very great for security isolation. Um, you know, if you can confine these things, but if you give everyone root and they have a full network stack running in there, that's going to get difficult. Um, and it's still a pet. And you know, in the end, it gets it's still too expensive per application. The overhead of managing a full operating stack per service in a multi-tier application is still too much. Right? We 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 see that um, you know, Open, OpenStack is trying to kind of make this really easy for people to do, but it's a it's really hard. We have um, we have a lot of like use cases that now try to get back to hardware support like things like dpdk that gives you user you know a big deal right now in like telco and uh, finance and so on. It's like specialized network stacks in user space because you know the general purpose linux kernel network stack is not the most efficient network stack for every use case right there are many use cases where you want your network data to be provided to your user space without the kernel doing anything with it problem with that is now we are patching the VM layer the, around the VM layers to give a user space application into in a virtual machine raw access to the hardware right? which is a bit crazy um, a big problem is is the VM sprawl right you have more and more of those you don't know exactly what's in there it's expensive to manage and you know a great it, it, it was actually I probably shouldn't use the exact example I usually use in relative to other presentations but let's say there is a product that that is um, sold as a VM appliance right so the only way you can get it is you, you download you download a VM image you instantiate you run it 
beautiful. It's a very nice way to get software. The operational model, however, is to log in into the production instance and do a YUM update. That's how you update security issues in your appliance. So it's not really an appliance. It's just a path distributed as an appliance for easier consumption so you don't have to deal with, with kickstart and install it. It's just a deployment. And, and when you when you want to uh, um, when you want to update to a new major version, it doesn't manage the database for you. You actually have to back up your database yourself, and then you know, snapshot your VM, and then you do a new one. Right? So it's basically just the same thing we did before with virtual uh, with this, uh, physical servers. Just you know a little bit easier to get the initial thing, easier get started and a bigger aggregation though. But it's not a new, not a better operational model at the end. It has all the same problems in reality of the late binding model that, that you have, you know, anyways with RPM. You're still updating RPMs, you're still um, touching your production environment where you, you know, the, the exact behavior of the production environment after an update depends on the specific state of a whole bunch of systems, including your your, your proxies, your uh, net internet connection at that time, whatever your software deployment system is. So it's really hard to to keep that under control. And there are some some bigger trends at play play in here. Um, you know, with DevOps, it's like rapid change. It's moving faster and faster. Your developers are doing CI/CD and um, and want to you know, push to production within hours of writing the code. Um, containers come along, right? Docker comes along and says, oh, now you can take these things and move them along, and everything is portable, and your developers can do whatever they want. Um, you know, Solomon Heights is, is, is the founder of Docker, is saying, hey, you can put whatever you want in your container, no one even wants to use RPM. Um, you know, at the same time, everything is software now, right? Um, like the, the current thing that everyone quotes is, I think some BMW guy saying, hey, like the, the deciding factor on car success going forward is not going to be the car, not going to be the, the hardware of the car, it's going to be the software running inside the car. You know, I think Tesla is proving that right now. It's, you know, building cars is a commodity. It's batteries and software and the autopilot that's going to make the difference. Um, as a result, ops has lost control. And traditionally, you had the operations people setting the standards for how, you know, what you can deploy, how you define your application, what the common, um, the gold images are, what are the stacks you can use, which version of Python you can write on, and all that. And it's gone because right now it's line of business and you know direct return to their own developers. And then, you know, at the end, ops is just, like, there's some compliance people who have a certain level of control because, you know, it's always bad to get hacked. But um, ops has no control over what developers put in their applications and what runs inside. And if they don't, if they don't provide the environment they want, everyone just goes to Amazon and does it. Right? Um, it's reality. Interestingly, open source also has one, right? It's just, you know, that debate is over. Like, you know, ten, five years ago, it was like, ah, oh, wow, open source is really, you know, safe, and you can try. You know, that's not even a, like nobody even asks, right? It's like it's more like, they, you know, there are all these people who try to claim that their stuff is open source, even though it's not really open source. That's kind of the problem right now. But it's not that like anyone without it open source is safe, right? Um, you know, there's sometimes like these, there's a CIO they get hacked, and it's like, oh, we won't need to know what we have, and. He says, oh, there's all this open source software, and it was an open source component that got hacked. And it's like, okay, we're not going to use open source anymore. And then everyone says, uh, well, you know, that's not going to work because everything we do is based on open source. Okay. There is no website on the planet that's not using open source. There's no transaction system. There's no stock exchange that doesn't use open source. I mean, aside from one in Russia. But um, <laughs> actually, yes. I have to deal with it. like a com interface for high frequency trading this is really really painful. But aside from that, there's almost no one anyone not using open source. Um, there's the whole cloud native thing, right? If you do like even you know the people are running around with mode one, mode two. I think it's a continuum, but you see people moving more into they, they expect elasticity. They expect it's kind of the on demand culture. It's like I think we went through that in in the broader culture that like no like 
unless unless you're watching the European Soccer Championship, or, or, or you wanna or you wanna see the Red Sox game. Like where you really want to know, you want to cheer before your neighbors cheer, right? Unless you have that competition, you don't want to be stuck to any kind of schedule. You want your stuff when you want it. I want to watch Supernatural when I want to watch Supernatural, not, you know, when, you know, whatever TV station schedules it. And that's kind of how IT works nowadays. I want it when I want it. I want the version. And the availability infrastructure, we want. so it's all on-demand cloud native, and they want to use the most current version of whatever is available. And you know, you, there is no broadcast model; it just is irrelevant. So um, unless you are on the physical, so for hardware, even a whole different thing because you, you, know, you kind of need the hardware still. But you know, if you're up in the application, not so much. Doesn't matter as much because you're too far removed. Um, so you end up with kind of like the world changing, right, between an op-centric environment with kind of a download to install model and a developer-centric one in a download to build model, and the developer-centric model is taking over the world, and everything else serves this model. That's the the macro challenge, and there's some you know some some data to to. Um, Support that, right? So um, this is this is just uh, it's from the internet, so it must be true. Uh, from module counts, it's a count of modules. But it, you know, it, order of magnitude is going to be correct, right? So Fedora has about like thirty thousand packages. Debian has uh, Debian answer has slightly more, like let's say forty thousand in in a version. So that's the addressable ecosystem of a Linux distribution. Uh, yeah, npmjs.org has two hundred twenty thousand. Packages and they're probably all clones of each other. And like, plus there's one with left pad right? that everyone used. But uh, you know, there is a whole bunch of there. There is no way a traditional Linux distribution is going to package all of that, repackage that in RPM, and that. <laughs> Why? <laughs> no one is going to do that, and uh, it, it, it's not going to work. Right? So the traditional Linux distribution is really challenging the application space. Right? It, we, we, it, you know, going back to that picture, right? we just don't have critical mass. Right? I, I can guarantee that any application developer right now you know, trying to, to build a node application, they won't find all their stuff in a Linux distribution. It's impossible. We have that internally. We have this, group building something and they came back and said, oh yeah, the version of Node you're shipping is too old and here are the 413 additional packages we need. And, then, and, and this combination of 430 packages is relevant exactly for one project because the next project, a week later, will use a different set of versions because in that amount of, you know, with that amount of software, the churn is incredible. So things are moving and moving and moving. And everyone is developing their own software, pulling in from this pool of open source software. Um, so we just, you know, we just don't have enough of the packages, and if we have the package, we don't have it in the right version because the time to repackage everything in RPM, distribute everything, is probably going to take longer. As some of these things churn upstream, and uh, you know, so as a developer, I have to go to an npm JS store anyways. I have to go to Maven Central anyways. Right? I cannot rely on the Linux distribution to give that to me, and there is no ops person anymore empowered enough to force me to only use the version that Reddit. Whoever you know, pick your pick your distributor or software vendor or whatever, um, you know, and it's just too slow. Um, and even you know, even if we were fast enough, like repackaging NPMs in RPM doesn't really have an intrinsic value on its own because they are already in NPM format. There's some the things like when you cross when you, when you need you have NPMs and you need the the binary dependencies. It's a bit nicer if you have an RPM, but that doesn't outweigh the downside of like having an wrap a package for something that already is packaged. Yeah, sometimes like when these installers on for high level language start compiling um, binaries locally, that's kind of back to the back to the eighties, right? Because again you're you're compiling on localhost, that's ugly. Right? So but RPM is not a solution to that because you know it, it's just it's trying to do the same thing slightly differently early on it's too slow. Um, 
And an important thing in this complexity, and the higher the stack you get, the more it's true. Um, testing for an application for an application stack is only valid if you actually test it with with the application you're going to run. Right? We prove that every time. And you know, Jerry, uh, the, the 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 team you working on is exactly about that problem. Right? We break our products all the time because we update. They, we have one product, two products using the same Python sh sh shelf. So I'm just making this up right now. Because but let's say two applications use the same version of the same Python shelf RPM as a dependency. You know, one of them wants a newer version, they update it, we break the other. Because we can't even test it in time. Because like, the, one, the, one needs to go out, they, they want an update of that, of that application. And even inside a single company like Red Hat, we can't ensure that everything gets tested in time to meet everyone's guidelines. Because they, are, they have their own business pressures and they will release software on their own on their own schedule. Every of our customers has that problem much more because you know it's our core business and for them it's just you know something they do as part like to support their business, not their core business. Right? So so you know this whole complexity, a late binding model with like an exploding dependency stack of software with a lot of new versions churn with everything being software. Managing that in the traditional model of a Linux distribution with a single package set that manages dependencies, it's just not going to work anymore. It's impossible. But just like Windows 10. <laughs> well, I thought that is a key law. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't read it. All. It's I, only just, not bad. Again, I read it on the internet. So. It's back to work. <laughs> um, so what that gets us to is really the containerized method. So what's the model here, right? You know, why why is Docker such a big deal, right? It's the problem <coughs> is the tools we had so far just aren't up to the task anymore, right? And if you look at the containers, let's say, and this is, Docker didn't invent it, right? You know, containers are a combination of three kernel features at large. You know, it's it, it namespaces, it's C groups, it, at least in our world, SE Linux. We want the then walls can talk like for everyone like how containers don't contain and he's right but at the end you know at least you want some level of security um, and you know at the end the whole point is that you partition the system in basically change routes on steroids it's 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 not someone calling it's my phone rebooting for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's the third time since I started talking. I don't know what's going on there. Um, so the, the, the idea, at the end of the idea of the containerized model is that you partition the system into system runtime and independent application runtimes. Where you use basically, you use containers, first of all, as, as change route on steroids. Um, and you get to a multi-instance, multi-version system, right? Because each namespace can have its own dependency tree. It starts, it's glibc up is in there, so you can have whatever you want in there. And you um, you package these things. And you know, Docker, it, it's like you know, so I, I, I diss it as the most ingenious way to use the tar command. Right? It's really just tarred up you know, lay it fuzz and deploy it to overlay FS or, or, or thin provisioning. But it's really beautiful because what it does is it does aggregate packaging. So it packages your application with the user space dependencies. Right? It reduces your dependency to the kernel syscall interface at lunch, right? And some shared service and APIs, which is much easier to manage than binary dependencies. Because it's aggregate packaging, you know, you you actually take the whole thing and move it through your build, dev, te uh, dev, uh, dev build, test, uh, uh, production cycle. So you're not changing it along the way. Um, and do you deploy it into containers, which is change which has, you know, partitions your system, and nothing new in there, right? It's been doing that forever in uh, Linux, Solaris, other, other operating systems before. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it gives you enough separation so applications don't disturb each other 
in the binary runtime, or you know, step on each other all the time. At the same time, it's not the black box of virtualization, right? It, it, ideally, a container is only the minimal things you need to use binary dependency of your applic specific application or your specific service, not even the full application, because most applications are more than one container. And you still can have containers operate on each other, right? So you can still, the, the sysadmin can still look inside, the host can look inside. You can give containers different levels of privileges. Um, you can actually have containers that operate on the host. I have a t-shirt called uh, it has truth slash host. It is you run our atomic uh, atomic host and you install the tools container, you you know your your tools are actually in a container and you have to truth into the host sometimes to do things. Which yeah, um, it's you know the the point is you separate the runtime so you can run things independent of what runs the underlying system or independent of what runs other pieces of the system. You have delegation of the container boundary, which is much more fine-grained than virtualization. You don't have the kernel data, you don't have network stacks, you can actually control what people are doing much better. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, you know, to give an example, right, if you go to Docker Hub, um, what uh, um, most of those containers, you know, there, there's some crazy things going on. Like, um, you know, Originally, Docker basically they put a command and it runs whatever whatever you put in there as PID one inside the container, which is crazy because you know you end up with a little zombie problem if something dies and stuff like that. It also means that everything is running as root, which is really crazy because they don't actually contain. So in reality, what we recommend is you run actually system D or you know, whatever your init system is inside the container, and you basically follow the existing best practice of uh, dropping privilege when you actually start something. Um, for example, in, in OpenShift, which I, I think I'll, I'll introduce later, so it's, a, it's our kind of scale out container platform. Um, it, it has the function to actually prevent things from running as a root inside the container. Yeah, because there's another service that can introspect what's actually going on. In a VM, that's basically impossible. Right? In containers, we can have system services take care of things like security, ensure that no, no Apache is running as a root. Um, because it's really a bad idea to do that. Um, there are a couple of use cases for containers. And um, you know, so the, on the left, a fully orchestrated multi-container because they kind of see the top end um, you know mode to cloud native thing where you 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 have a whole bunch of microservices basically commoditizing um, the concept that Java had with containers and microservices into the operating. You do individual containers, and you have an orchestration layer for Reddit, that's Kubernetes. Uh, Mesos is popular in that space. Docker has uh, Swarm and Compose, so they have their own thing there. Um, that that is kind of the this I call it a multi-host system, right? It's an init system for the cluster. It's a cluster manager. It places the services, and it has a, it defines the language how you describe an application and its dependencies. So you know, services, replication, external interface, things like that. Um, so these containers are built, they are always built in a build server, right? It means you actually do the aggregate packaging model. You have a Docker file somewhere or a build service and you build a container and then whenever something needs to be updated, you rebuild that container. Um, you use things like Kubernetes to handle and you use like things like Ansible uh, uh, or Puppet or other orchestra management tools against higher level APIs. There's another set of containers which are loosely orchestrated. This is something you know that the, the core system itself is in that category. So, if, if depending, containers support any kind of hybrid model, right? If you take Fedora or RHEL or Debian, you can just run a container on any normal system, right? It just is, uh, it's a set of processes with some using some specific kernel feature to make them look slightly different when you are in that context. Put them in the context. However, you can um, you can run the rest of the system in a traditional way. Now, if you buy fully into uh, the model that we have as the atomic architecture, or that Core OS has with like an immutable operating system, where your your host is actually in itself just an image deployment, in our in our case an OS tree deployment that in itself cannot be changed, so you can't yum update individual packages there. 
the way you deploy software on top of that is as a container. So even system servers, even management <coughs> agents are run as containers with special privilege in these systems. Right? And those you know, usually are not, they are loosely orchestrated because they often stand alone things, they are not uh, orchestrated by Kubernetes. When you deploy OpenShift, Kubernetes itself is a container. So loosely orchestrated containers, either like something that you deploy on a single machine, um, you roll out once, you put in a unit file or an init script that starts this container. Um, you still build it in a build service. You still have the model that you know I build it somewhere and then I deploy this binary reproducible package. Right? It's that's pretty much how like for the last. 13 years, I remember, we have been deploying certain applications on Linux that had um, graphical installers. Oracle was always a great example, because they had this Java-based <coughs> graphical installer, at least, you know, back in the day, when they still do that, that like, was a pain to run in production. So what you did is you run it on a, on a, on a pre-test build machine, and run it once, then build an RPM with just the package part of the RPM spec file, the build part, to wrap all the Oracle files into an RPM, then deploy that, so you have binary reproducible packaging. It's kind of what we do here with Docker. We define uh, a Docker file, a make file for an aggregate package that takes a set of pre-existing binary artifacts and puts them into an aggregate package so we can roll them out um, without having to change things on the fly in production. Um, and that gives you like the, these two columns, like the fully orchestrated or is the individual container with loose orchestration. What it gives you is basically the ability to you know get rid of this late binding model. It's an early binding approach to how we distribute software production. You make all your changes in the test in, in the build environment, then you test it, and then you roll it out, and you roll it out quickly because you have you know it's just an incremental layer you deploy as a system that takes care of rolling out, and you can roll back switch back and switch forward, you never touch actually the, the, the stack on the component level that you deploy. Now there's a third use case, and it's, um, it's kind of a niche use case, but it's still important. And that is basically the same thing I described with the virtual appliance earlier. I use Docker just a bootstrap environment to pull up a different, um, different environment, a different runtime, to partition your system and you still run yum inside. That model, it's a niche model, but it's important if you have existing applications that you cannot easily move into this pre-packaged, aggregate packaging distribution model. You know, my uh, uh, common use case is um, playing around, uh, you know, um, I'm using Unison to sync files with a RHEL 6 server I have at home. The problem is uh, Unison is written in OCaml, which is the best language ever, but it also changed its uh, serialization format uh, recently. So the compatibility of Unison now, you know, with client and server on the API level now depends on which version of the compiler was used. And in you know, my laptop, I'm running Fedora 23, and so the version of the compiler is different inherently. And yes, I looked into compiling the uh, older compiler stack uh, for Fedora. I gave up very quickly. I'm instead running just a little container here with RHEL 6 in, on, on my laptop that just runs Unison. Right? And I didn't bother putting it to a build service because, like, because it's my laptop and it's my existing operational model for my laptop to just run YUM and DNF and stuff like that. It just works. right? It's, just a change root environment running a different GDT, a different Linux distribution in the same environment. I mount, cross mount things I need. And so now I don't have to recompile stuff. So it's basically just multiplexing an environment. And yes, it's not the, where we want people in general is, is on the left, um, on the left of this. But, uh, you know, if you get started, it's totally okay. Or if you have an existing application, you don't, you know, you don't want to change your operational model. Just, just treat it as a change rule. And you know, there's um, we have a little prototype going on where we use our atomic host. As I said, this is a, a variant of RHEL, same thing as RHEL, but deployed as an OS tree, which is a, a symlink tree. So you can't update, you can't run RPM in there. It's not possible. Can't install. ETC is writable, but so it's stateful, but it's immutable from the software distribution point of view. And it's it's kind of an image deployment, but with R sync on the file level for efficiency rather than full image. As you know, basically rollbacks implemented and stuff came out. I think the, the GNOME guys did that 
originally um, Colin Walters did it for GNOME for their CI system. And um, the, the, the thing is, what, what, what we're playing around now is like, do that um, and then uh, put the SSH on the host on port 2222, instantiate a single version of any operating system you want with SSH on 22 as a privileged container. So it has, it's basically just a file system namespace that puts your file system away from the host. So you can run an older Linux distribution on a newer kernel. The kernel syscall API, unless you really depend on details in proc and sys, you're usually good to go. Right? And your application will never know that it's running in a container. Because for all intents and purposes, you're treating it like a normal Linux machine. Until the point you need to do something in proc every time. <laughs> or some devices got to remain. But, um, aside from that, uh, it's pretty good. So, so it, it provides a path even you know, to separate, to, to partition your system, to get out of this monolithic, everything needs to be compatible with everything, um, and I can't have multiple versions of things. You can get out of that pretty easily, even in the existing operational model, with all, without all the, 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 the downsides of, of virtual machines. Um, so at the end, what we get to is basically a container stack, and, and you know, where an application, the ideal case, application is a set of orchestrated services. And that's actually not that revolutionary. Uh, pretty much most applications written in the last 10 years should be at least two, usually three tiers. Right? Let's say five years. But most of them are nowadays. Right? For those, it's pretty straightforward what you do, and then you can de decompose further. Um, the host is delivered as immutable and updated as a tree, so you don't have to mess around with that. You just configure it. And you have a multi-tenant environment um, in there through the container uh, uh, environment. And then you, you use it and you, you integrate with the underlying infrastructure. Um, there are some things, some additional things you want to do. Uh, we kicked off a project called uh, uh, Atomic App um, slash Nulicube, which is kind of a transport for the full application. The problem you have right now is that Docker is, it's, Docker is beautiful, right? It gives users aggregate packaging, including transport and deployment and update, what they didn't do is provide a transport for the multi-container application definition. And no one, Kubernetes didn't, Mesos did. So you basically still get checking out templates and VI or whatever. Pico editing uh, your, your, um, your definition. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's kind of a cloud mindset because all these people think you never leave their, 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 the, the one environment. The problem is that means that when you want to move an application from, let's say, uh, one instance of, of OpenShift to another instance of OpenShift, or you're an ISV, you want to distribute something, or you, you, know, you want to consume a predefined MySQL cluster in your own application without editing config files, they, they, they don't support it. Like, you know, my use case there is like today, um, you know, in, in, in Red Hat, we have this uh, identity management in free IPA. You can yum install free IPA and then run free IPA install uh, or config or install or something like that. It asks you a bunch of questions and you have like a integrated DNS, Kerberos, PKI system running, right? With two commands and a bunch of questions. You know, I, if I do that with containers now, I'm checking out like a, config, a Kubernetes config file, then I'm editing that, and then I'm handing it over with some command line to a cluster. And when I want to move it to another machine, I have to like do the same over thing, same over again. That's a functional regression. I want to have the same kind. I want that kind of an MSI-like experience, right? You know, Microsoft got some things actually right. MSI is actually a pretty good idea because it gives you the ability to. Uh, have a standard for how does an application definition get moved and how, what's the standard for parameterizing. So there are some project like uh, um, one is Helm and, and the other one, another one, ours is, is Atomic App, that tries to define a standard how you move you know, from the individual container to the full application portability. Um, and you know, overall, if you put this all together, like from a Red Hat point of view, and you can exchange these the individual pieces of this and then you, know, you get what probably most systems will look like. You, know, you get kind of to three tiers of, of the system, right? The infrastructure, 
where I don't put Linux in the infrastructure anymore. You know, it might be running down there if you have an open source cloud or, you know, most of the clouds run on Linux nowadays as part of the, you know, somewhere in the hypervisor. But that's not the point, right? You don't see that. You're running something on the hypervisor or you're running bare metal. Um, but one level is the infrastructure that support, it provides a certain set of Services, storage network being the most prominent ones, identity, depending where you are, they provide more. Then you have an application runtime that gives you a common runtime to run containers and uh, a lifecycle management for those containers that includes CI, CD, um, and, and you know, the build, the workflow, the registry. Um, it will have management pieces that plug in there, like scanning, like uh, a policy that only containers that, you know, came through some uh, compliance gate, can be deployed, things like that. So that's where you have the policy for the application lifecycle management. And on top of that, you have the application content, right? which, which starts with some base image. It starts with some glibc or libc equivalent. On top of that, you have framework like Python, Java, PHP, and so on. You have package services, which is predefined um, you know, databases, pre-built messaging service, all things you just consume. And then you have your own custom application that you write on. And that's supported by some developer tooling and some management tooling. And it's really the software, the, the application-centric software space. Um, the important <coughs> piece is that that really refactors the Linux distribution. Right? So the, the from, from the, the traditional product of the Linux distribution now it becomes the application platform. Right? It's moving into that space. So going forward, Linux distribution, and, you know, if you look at Snappy, it's basically the same thing, right? It's a platform to run aggregate packaged applications. Yeah. If you look at where Red Hat is going, and you'll, you'll see everyone else going in that direction. So Linux distribution focuses on the application runtime. And it's, you know, CoreOS is exactly the same thing, right? It's the, it's the kernel to container interface. So it has Docker in there. And it has some cluster manager in most cases because going forward, you know, everything other than your laptop is a cluster, right? No one runs single machines anymore. That, you know, okay, I should they? Up to now, the single machine was the default use case, and the cluster was kind of the addition, the extension that's turning around. The default now is the cluster, and the single machine is the exception in any kind of enterprise uh, environment. And um, and then it, they will have either in that or as a you know sometimes as a separate product, but all of them will have an application lifecycle management here that at a minimum manages the build service, the CI/CD, and uh, how you move these things around. So you can have the same, you know, the rapid iteration of, um, you know, there is, a, there, there is an errata advisory or there is a new version, either from your developers or induced by some security or defect issue, and you can immediately turn around and pull out a new version within some policy. And on top of that, then, there are going to be different offerings for how do you get your content with two ecosystems, right? One is packaged services, that's pre, like the things you just consume usually, like a database, like a messaging service, and the other is developer content. So that's download to install content, and on the left side you still have download to build content, which is all the libraries you build in your own application. That's the model uh, you'll, you'll see everything go, go into, and then this application runtime basically has the drivers to integrate with the underlying infrastructure. You can run it on bare metal, and it's going to have point-to-point -point integration with storage services and you know, optimization agents that you can install. But um, my laptop will now suspend unless I plug it in, which is a good timer. Um, so uh, yeah, so so it will integrate if you run it on an OpenStack. It's going to talk to Neutron to connect the networking of your of your containers, so you don't end up with overlay on overlay on overlay, right? So it's going to take care of the integration in the underlying infrastructure, um, but it's going to provide a stable interface for your applications to use. The application, though, is not going to be focused on the the broad interface you have today in Linux is going to be focused on basically the kernel syscall interface and APIs that the system provides. Um, 
and you know to map that to the which like you know you see I'm a real artist with slides uh, to map that what I try to say here is that you know, if you look at the public cloud today going back to the vertical integration point from earlier the public cloud tries to be the orange box right they try to give you all of this package services down and you know sometimes the frameworks and you just use it and the Linux the new generation of Linux is the next generation of what today is a Linux distribution will be um, the abstraction layer that you can use to break out of this vertical integration and that's you know what it's going to look like <laughs> so, um, the act of cats, well, and unicorns, and fire. <laughs> All right, I'm um, the golden gun. And um, if uh, if you like the picture, there's the URL where I found it. So. <laughs> and I'll just shut down for this. Right, so, well, any. Questions, discussion. If I wanted to create my own pet container, yes, and, you know, just you know, a minimal one, and yes. a hello world example type thing, what would I need? Um. So if you just want to try, like, if you, most most people give you base images, you just start from. So what you do is basically uh, Docker run. Any you know, container like Docker run Fedora, and we will we'll create a container, and then you can run Yum inside. Um, if you want it to have kind of like this interact with the host experience, you need to add some command line to give it privileges to the host. And be, by default, it will not be able to access the host. Um, if you use a RHEL, in or actually Fedora, what you can do is just atomic on Fedora. Uh, what you can try is atomic install. Um, rel 7 dash tools or rel 7 slash rel tools or something uh, and, and uh, that will actually give you a container that runs with high privilege so you can even true to the host and things like that so you know the beautiful thing about like docker is that it's just docker run and you have a container and you you can do whatever you want in there to change root environment. Okay. I recently heard about the uh, distribution called Cube uh, with Cube. Uh, it basically runs every application in its own VM. Cube's OS? Cube's OS, as it, that was um, this. Um, a, so th that was a security project, right? Um, I'm wondering about that. That seems kind of heavyweight to me. Yeah. I'm wondering how well, easy it would be to. Uh, like uh, sort of redo that uh, and use the Docker instead of uh, VMs. The problem is that you don't get the same level of security, right? The, so a VM is a very hard thing to break out of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not impossible, but very hard. A container. In, at the end, you you're talking to the to a shared kernel, which is called API. Any mm -hmm. any privilege escalation, the kernel has a good chance of getting you out of there, especially if you're running as a root, right? So. If, you, if you're doing the best practice, run your application non-root, um, that gets better. There's a project the GNOME guy started called Bubble Wrap. That's kind of like a way to run a Docker container. It's kind of like an integrated pseudo-like thing, so that the, the payload of the container never gets root access. Um, so there are things like that starting. That probably will get you closer to it. But at the end, for like the use case of Qt was kind of you know separate your banking um, I yeah I, I, I for 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 application you no know, for for single in inside a company inside it's okay it's containers actually in fact are more secure than how we use desktops most of the time I right? even the fedora desktop we run unconfined right? you're usually not using as Linux very much because it's getting too hard. So separating things into containers helps a little bit because each container at least is a separate security domain, but it doesn't get you the same level of security that a VM would get you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
That's why at the end I think that any kind of multi-tenancy that involves giving people root access at, at some point will still um, still have VMs in this. I mean, like, you know, for example, we have we have a project to um, basically map pods to VMs, so we can so a, a pod is kind of a concept that Kubernetes introduced that uh, um, core as adopted into Rocket, which is an alternative to Docker doing the kind of the same things, um, which is a scheduling unit, and you put multiple containers into a single pod, and then you can schedule, that's how, how Kubernetes schedules on multiple hosts, right? A pod is always scheduled together, then where we can guarantee that we have containers that operate on each other, right? Cross-mount stuff, or like a, a volume container that provides storage to another container. They're always together, right? Because if you put them on multiple hosts, it wouldn't work anymore, because they really need to mount things on the same host. And so there's a project to basically map pods to VMs, to be able to have secure pods that you know provide more security than the than just as mm -hmm. um, But the real, you know, the problem is, um, it, it, and, and you know, there, there is other work going on, like a, a, a libseccomp and Docker now has seccomp uh, um, support. So you can more securely drop privilege and remove capabilities to access kernel interfaces. So you, you know, you can do something, but it's not. It will never be as secure as VMs, right? because VMs have a very strict separation. So with those security concerns, do you think that containers are ready for prime time, ready to go into the enterprise at scale? Yeah, so, um, so A, you can still run them in a VM if you have this concept. So I would draw the line as multi-tenancy with single-tenancy in general. Um, but even in multi-tenancy, so, we have been running OpenShift uh, online for a couple of years, um, pre-Docker, um, with you know, just like the same kernel features, just uh, um, with di directly talking to C groups as Linux and namespaces, um, and uh, you know it's secure enough. Um, we are moving to OpenShift three is in, in online, is in beta now. That's Docker based. Uh, we ship it as an enterprise on-premise product today, and we have a dedicated offering. The online thing, the difference is that we basically we don't know who is running the app there, right? It's an online, like, open thing. You can just get an account and do your application. In that one, we're going to prevent you from running applications as root. So by default, you know, it basically will we'll make sure that you drop privilege in your in, a, in in your CMD part of the Docker file, and then you can run whatever you want. We don't trust it enough to let the you know, people we don't know on our servers run an application, <laughs> okay. even though they, it would be still in a Linux, but that's just a bit too much. So and so hmm? no, but, uh, I think it's a it's a so Docker. There are two. The, the point where you have, where by default everything runs as PID1 and root is a design mistake. In it's, it's a major design flaw. They should have put like a mini init wrapper in there that just like wraps whatever you put in the CMD. And that would have been like 50 lines of code to just like take care of privilege uh, management and, and reaping zombies. Right? And they didn't do that because they think, hey, you won't have multi-service containers. In reality, most containers I see that are actually used in production still have an init system inside the container and run multiple services. Because it's just, you know, even if you don't want to run multiple services, it's just so much easier if you can just, you know, yum install the pieces that you already have, right? Or use the same best practice you have before on the host. Doesn't mean that they're fat, it just means they use the same structure of deployment. The, the, the side effect is that it takes care of privilege dropping, right, because that's the existing best practice you have, and it takes care of reaping the zombies so you don't end up with, you know, zombie processes if, like, the parent process dies. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.